everybody, this is Mike Oppenheim, and you are listening to Coffin Talk, Interviews with the Living, a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life. This week we have, coming from the Dallas, Texas area, Mr. J. Gordon Cohn. He spent the past 35 years supporting leadership development and organizational change. His current focus is helping leaders deal with uncertainty and complexity. He's on a mission to put a little daylight between people and their assumptions. Uh, He's also the founding partner of the consulting firm Unstuck Minds. And you can find him on the web and there'll be notes to find it. But I'm a subscriber and I avidly look forward to it. I've also read one of his books and... uh, this is a funny side note, but it's no longer a side note to me. He's actually a relative of mine because I married his uh, niece and his his uh, my mother-in-law is his sister. So we'll get into that a little bit, I'm sure. But Jay, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mike. It's good to be here. It's great to have you on. You were actually someone that we had on a short list back when we were like planning the podcast. And I don't know how we got 150 episodes away, but it's awesome to have you on. Uh, well, I'm not I, I, I'm not feeling like you intentionally left me out. I'm OK. All right. Good to hear. Um So uh, we always ask standard three questions of our guests before we get rolling, which is um, how old are you? Where did you grow up? And what generation, if any, do you consider yourself a member of? Uh, I am 65, um, or as I like to say, I am Medicare. (laughs) And I uh, where I grew up is not you would think that'd be an easy question to answer. Um, I was born in Chicago, lived there until I was 11. And then for reasons that are still a little mysterious, my parents uh, decided to uh, quit their jobs, sell the home, sell all the worldly belongings, uh, buy a Volkswagen camper with a pop-up top, took me out of school. I was about to go into uh, junior high. And we traveled around the country in this van for the better part of a year. Uh, ended up in Phoenix, where I finished junior high and high school. Um, I guess that's so. I think that's officially, the, you know, where I grew up. I think after high school, it's no no more growing up. So, uh, so that was that. And then generation, um, I, you know, I'm I'm technically a baby boomer, I guess. Um, but at the tail end, I kind of a cusp. I'm I'm in I'm a, the youngest of the baby boomers. That makes sense. Um, and so it's fair to say that your parents were huge pot smoking hippies, right? I mean, buying a van. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, either that or they were on the witness protection program. I'm not sure which. I mean, it's, it's strange because uh, you've mentioned it. We've, you know, we've had a lot of dinners together and, and we know each other. Uh, it, it never came out the way you just said it. And I never even paused to think about it. But like the joke about the pot thing is they were anything but. So I'm I'm curious, like, do you have a theory? This was funny that you mentioned that they to my knowledge, they were not regular pot smoking hippies, but uh, it was 1969. Wow. If, if someone's done the math, they'll figure <laughs> that out. But uh, just before we left uh, for this adventure, they actually had a pot party at the neighbor's house across the street. <laughs> And uh, it, according to the story, it was their first experience with marijuana. Uh, and I think my mother reported getting a headache and uh, my father reported not feeling anything at all. And I, as far as I know, that was the last time they tried it. Um, but you could also check in with my sister, Judy, who might have also been there, but she may remember the story better than me um, since I was pretty young. Wow. This is just so interesting to me. And um, um your your niece Alana, my wife. Uh, we have a daughter, and her middle name is Rose, which is named after your mother. Um, and uh, so I, I like care a lot about this woman, who unfortunately I never got to meet. But um, I, I just find this fascinating. I can't I can't move on to any other questions because it's <laughs> it's like interesting that you have this story that I'm sure some people share, but probably not a whole lot of people. And also because the way compulsory education works now that would be a real like legal uh, risk to pull a kid out of school for a full year. Like it's, it's, you know, there's like accountability measures and stuff. Do you know if that like, was at all an issue? Were you, were they giving you books to read on the van? Like how was that year of education for you? <laughs> uh, it, it started, it started off um, it, it disciplined and then, and then it fell apart really fast. So what I remember, I like, I have a very distinct memory of going to the, principal of the junior high that I would have been starting had we stayed in Chicago. And I'm pretty sure that that the principal said, 
you know, it. this sounds like a really amazing experience. And Jay will probably get more out of this than a year of sixth grade here. So if you're interested in the textbooks that he would be using, we're happy to sell those to you. And as far as I know, that was the extent of it. Uh, I, I'm not sure that there had to be there was any paperwork or anything else that had to that happened. Uh, and you know, for maybe three or four weeks during this trip, um, my mom taught or supposedly um, English and social studies, and my dad was math and science. Um, and they they made a, a game attempt at sort of taking me through the textbooks, but they gave up on it pretty quickly. And uh, the good news was that the schools that I had been in were pretty good. And so by the time we got to Phoenix, even though I had missed the better part of a year, uh, I wasn't held back and I was able to continue on uh, into seventh grade. Yeah, uh, I live in Phoenix, so I feel safe saying this. You could probably skip three grades and move here. (laughs) (laughs) But the the. The the thing the, the I guess the thing that that was interesting about the trip, apart from just them yanking me out of school and away from my home and my fa- and my friends, was that that they didn't know where they wanted to end up. Mm-hmm. Like Phoenix was not the destination. Uh, it was more like uh, they settled they settled for Phoenix because it was just you know I think mainly my mother was tired of going around in the van but the idea was that we would camp in this volkswagen camper until we got to a city that looked promising and then we'd rent an apartment for a month to check out the city and decide if we wanted to live there the only criteria was that it had to be warmer than chicago wow you know to my personality this actually makes a lot of sense it sounds like something i would ask alana to do um it sounds like something she'd say (laughs) no to but um that's i actually love it and um and it actually segues nicely into like you yourself i mean you're a hell of a traveler but i I think one of the most amazing things i've heard about is is your bike trips um do you want to get into any of those oh well it was yeah there was one it's interesting because i just came back from a month in flagstaff and it was the first time that i was able to tell my daughters uh the story of when i was in high school and and took a a bike trip from phoenix up to flagstaff uh and they were able to actually we were driving on the freeways and the and the back roads that i was on on that bike trip but yeah i don't um i was opposed to getting my driver's license um you know at the time that most of my friends were getting their driver's license at 16 I, I didn't actually get my driver's license until 24. Um, that's that's a story in and of itself. But uh, one of the what I did have as my main mode of transportation in high school was my bike, and I would travel everywhere on my bike. And we did have one summer where uh, a friend and I rode our bikes from Phoenix up to Flagstaff. You you couldn't go on the main freeway, so we had to go kind of. Um, I think it's Kingman or yeah, I can't remember um, exactly the route, but you have to go up like Yarnell Hill and up Prescott and into Jerome and it's Sedona and wow. like that. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it, it's a beautiful and um, very steep climb from Phoenix up to Flagstaff that way. And, and then um, as far as like, so it's interesting because we're touching on a lot of things and like I have an impression of you and I know you well and I want to make sure I like paint that for my audience as best as I can. Um, you're also like quite intellectually driven. You're very smart. You're very interesting. You, your career has been helping people in like a lot of like restaurant businesses and other as consulting. But like with this like philosophy meets intellectualism, which is like a total appeal to my personality because, you know, I, I read your newsletters, I've read your book, and even in your bio, when you say uncertainty and complexity, um, when did you develop this like curious and confident personality that would become the man you are now with this kind of work? Yeah. Um, well, thank you for that question. And I'm, I, I'll see if I can't figure that out a little bit as I answer it. Um, I mean, I think some of this is probably an accident of just a lot of the weird ways in which I was raised. Um, 
a lot of it is probably some genetics. Uh, my dad was a very interesting guy um, that, you know, he was very smart. And I actually have two half brothers. Uh, so he had three sons. The other two were with a different wife, but they're, they're both PhDs. Um, one of them died, uh, but he was a, he was a physics professor before he, um, gave up his, uh, professor, professorship and decided to, uh, join a commune and make jewelry. And, uh, speaking of Sedona, he actually opened a, a jewelry shop in Sedona, uh, in, uh, Tlaquepaque. Uh, so I think, you know, some of this is, may have been inevitable, but, um, when I went to college, my intention was to be an engineer. Uh, I was very interested in math and science. And I think my first year in undergrad, I was at a liberal arts college in Portland, Oregon, and found uh, philosophy. And that's, you know, after a lot of different schools and a lot of time, I eventually did get a philosophy degree. And then my next degree was in business. So I have, a, I have a, an undergrad in philosophy, and then I have an MBA. Uh, and, and then I went on for my own PhD in organizational systems. So, you know, it's a, it's a variety, like, I think variety is the key that, that links all those things together. And that is probably what, what keeps me interested and, um, and connected to this idea of complexity and uncertainty. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. And that's really, that does make a lot of sense. And um, this is where we kind of shift into like metaphysics and everything. Uh, do you believe that the universe is inherently uncertain and complex? And do you believe that like what we're doing here on earth is like merely, but a part of that? I mean, like where, where do you see like the big picture meets just like you're a man named Jay, I'm a guy named Mike and we're here talking on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, um, I, I think that that you that words like you know uh, complex and uncertain are definitely the human language game. Uh, the universe probably doesn't particularly care what we think of it, um, and so I think we may experience things as uncertain and complex, um, but that says more about us than than the nature of the universe. I suspect. Yeah, actually, that makes a lot of sense. And so were you um, amidst either in the Chicago part or the year traveling or just once you got to Phoenix, uh, did your parents take you to any religious things? Like, were, did you have a religion formally growing up? Hey, everyone. If you're a fan of the show, please head over to MikeyOp.com and click the subscribe button. It's the best way to support us, and it's free. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P dot com. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I mean... We we are Jewish. Uh, my mother used to tell all of her friends that uh, that what she was most uh, interested in was celebrating any kind of event or activity that brought people together for a good meal and exchanging gifts. So um, I grew up knowing that I was Jewish, living in a suburb of Chicago that was heavily Jewish. Uh, but I don't, we didn't really, other than the high holy days, have a regular kind of religious ritual. And I don't think I was particularly well educated at first on Judaism. We celebrated, I say celebrated, we, we had a, we did things for Christmas. Uh, my father was very famous for his Easter egg hunts. Um, but, um, but when I went to college, uh, I ended up spending my summers at a conservative Jewish summer camp because I needed a job. I eventually became the director of that camp. And it was over the various summers that I learned a lot about Judaism. Um, it didn't fundamentally change kind of how I view the world or the role of, of Judaism in my life. But it was interesting to learn all that stuff. I felt more connected to uh, kind of a heritage. Uh, 
I will say for some reason, when we went, when we ended up in Phoenix, my mother decided that I needed to get bar mitzvah, but I suspect that had more to do with her wanting to throw a party than <laughs> having me, you know, being formally um, ushered into uh, manhood uh, as you know, in the religion. So since Judaism came up and since I spend an inordinate amount of time with your sister, your littlest sister, uh, my mother-in-law, Anne, who's going to be on the podcast someday, (laughs) I am dying to ask you on air and you can answer it however you want. How do you feel about her slow and consistent entrance into Orthodox Judaism, given that all of you were raised with kind of like literally a hallmark attitude towards religion? (laughs) Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Uh, in a word, baffled. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, 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 uh, I've stopped trying to figure it out. Uh, but you know, one of I, one of my occupational hazards is overthinking things. So I think there was a point in time when I felt like Anne found a community that was that treated her in a, in a way that met some needs that she had not yet experienced with other communities that she was part of. And I think that that is what opened the door. Um, I have a hard time thinking that her fundamental belief system and worldview has shifted, uh, but I could be wrong about that. I, I don't know. We haven't really talked about it. But I do find it, you know, on the one hand, kind of funny um, because I, I'm, I don't it doesn't really affect me. But then sometimes, uh, you know, if I'm in town or trying to visit and I have to work around the Sabbath or some other holiday, it's sometimes it's annoying but um, but otherwise, I'm happy that she has found something that has has given her meaning and purpose and that she finds satisfying. I mean, you know, as as her brother, I I think that's uh, I think all of us. It'd be great if all of us could find such a thing. I'm just amazed that that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. I actually think that's a very good answer. And when she listens to this, I'll be interested to hear what she says about that, because I think that's a lot of people that I interview on this show are like that. Um, and it's not for better or for worse. I think it's just that's really part of what a religion is, is it's a it's an organized community as opposed to just like I live in my own headspace and I have my own theories and I'm not even going to test them or bounce them around with other people. And so speaking of which, um, what is your exact theory uh, on what is going to happen to you, not what happens to other people, but what's going to happen to you when you die? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's an interesting so so i can have a theory about me yes but it doesn't have to apply to anybody else i have a reason for say, phrasing it that way and i can get into it one of them would be um solipsism i forget if i'm pronouncing it correctly but that's the idea where like yeah solipsism you, yeah. yeah solipsism so that would be one of the reasons but there's others but yeah um yeah okay um well i don't i don't have a theory um I, I don't obviously know. I suspect that, the, you know, the interesting thing about the question is that you, you asked it about me and as opposed to sort of what when your body stops, you know, operating, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, what what what's next? And. I think that um, I think that embedded in the question, and I, I apologize for getting kind of intellectual no, about no, this, this, but is you know, perfect. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but part, but you know, like one of the things that that our business is is built on, and something that is of interest to me is the relationship between the assumptions that we hold and the framing of the questions that we ask about things. Like oh, that, wow. to me, is a just a really important idea. And so the first, the first thing that occurs to me about life and death is I, I'm always a little skeptical when things are dualistic, you know, like either or 
like there's you know life and then there's death and those those are the two things and they're they're meant to be in opposition of from each other so uh so i suspect that that it's not quite as clean as that and then the other piece of this is the idea of my identity uh which is is i think just a construct of of consciousness uh just because of the our human apparatus mm -hmm. um we uh the default is for us to identify with some self um my guess is that the one thing that probably happens when the body gives out is that we're no longer I, I say we, not knowing exactly what I'm referring to here, but mm -hmm. you know, the 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 self is no longer uh, identified with a physical uh, object, our bodies. So that's probably the one thing that happens at death is that uh, the 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 self, the illusion of the self, dies. Mm -hmm. uh, and so whether, but but beyond that. I don't have any particular beliefs around some sort of existence or transition to some other kind of existence. I, I'm, I, I tend, my intuition is that, that there's nothing like that. That's really interesting. So because your take is so unemotional, I'm curious, uh, at times, do you ever fear death? And that's very different from asking, do you want to live forever? Do you not want to die? Because I know you have a wonderful wife and children and, and a vibrant life. So it's not really aimed at that. It's more at like, is there a fear of like, uh Oh, what if this mind body identity just disappears? No, I mean, not, not at all. I, I think, um, I would not look forward to, you know, the, you know, aging and the things that happen to the body as, as it starts to wear out. So if, if there's any kind of, you know, sort of emotion attached to my mortality, it's more about aging than it is about ending. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the death itself, um, I would say that, uh, that it's not so much a fear, but more of a a desire that I have to end that that the end uh, from of me mm -hmm. uh, is not does not create distress for people that love me. Wow. That's awesome. Having done hospice care, not a lot of people have that understanding that I have and you have, which is really, that is the only thing you should be wishing for is that you're not in any way burdening people when you go on, especially with like laws about burials and things like that. There's so many things I think people don't think about depending on which country you live in and everything. Um, and so since you brought it up, actually, I am curious, do you care about which moral philosophies your children have, or are you like completely indifferent to that? Like, how do you feel about your progeny and how much you do or do not affect their philosophical mindset? Um, it, it, yeah, it's a great question. I don't care in the sense that I want them to have a particular point of view about things or a moral philosophy. Of course, I want them to behave in a way that I consider to be ethical uh, and that that they find meaning and purpose in life. But there are many ways to do that. And whatever they find and figure out is is cool with me. Um, there, there are times when we might get into arguments or disagreements that I suspect are probably more generational in nature than philosophical in nature. But um, I mean, I can imagine, like, I could imagine a situation and when, where one of them might move in it, like, <laughs> if one of them, if one of them became like my sister, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> for, for some, for some reason, uh, I would be, I would be confused and, uh, I would, I would probably want to understand it. And, and I, I might inadvertently be trying to influence it in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like I shouldn't. So, um, so no, I guess the short answer is no, I, I don't care really 
what they adopt. And ultimate, and, and at this point, mm-hmm. uh, I think the extent of whatever influence I, Catherine and I might have had, that's it's gone, right? <laughs> like we did, we 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 lived our lives. They were with us. And now they're living their lives, you know, three, three adults out in the world. Um, and I'm, I'm happy for them and they seem to be doing great. So, yeah. Um, I just met them and they awesome. They're awesome. And they do seem to be doing great. And so that's why I felt comfortable asking. Um, I wouldn't have asked you if, you know, I had any like red flags that I'd be worried about. Um, and so, oh yeah, no, no worries. Thank you. Uh, because you brought it up, but it's also always top of mind for me. Um, Anyone who's like living right now, no matter what age you are, you're in a part of a cycle. And whether you want to admit that or not, if you just read enough history and you look at things, there's just there's a cyclical nature to like one generation reacting to the other and so on and so on. And most of it is just rebellion and stuff. So I am curious, um, something that I'm noticing. And so this is me sticking my neck out with my opinion is that a lot of this yeah. air quote culture war is based on assumptions actually on every side. And so I'm curious since that's like what your career is built on and you're literally an expert on it. Um, am I off? Am I on? Is uh, Do you see any of that? And and then depending on your answer, what are some suggestions you might have? Yeah. Why do you uh, choose cycle to describe these times that we are in as opposed to say, a pattern or a system. I'm interested in why the cycle comes up for you. Yeah, there's uh, two reasons. One would be that it's literally half of the phrase feedback cycle. And I believe this is based on a lot of feedback that a generation uh, feeds back to the generation that before it, uh, based on what they see as flaws and, and, and good things. And then the other reason is that I literally, because of my job of book indexing, I index like way too many books on history. And most of it is just showing how like, the Spanish flu was 1919, COVID was 2020, uh, World War I was the 20s, and World War II was the 40s. We're in the 20s now, and there's a similar populist movement that we saw. Like, So that's the other reason. So it's those two. Yeah, so sort of um, generations reacting to previous generations. Correct, yes. Creating similar dynamics. Um, so I, I do think that individuals hold assumptions, you know, and so in, in collections of individuals sort of create a worldview or a zeitgeist. And uh, we, do, we do seem to be moving into a period uh, where there are tensions that, um, that I, don't, I don't have a, you may know this better than I in terms of whether there's a, a history that feels like it's repeating itself. But I think the thing that the thing, the thing that's interesting to me about current times is that we also have technology, which is exacerbating some of these cycles uh, because we are connected to more people more easily than ever before. And I have a feeling that that is creating um, creating kind of tribes faster than we may have ever created them before. That it's very easy for you to isolate yourself and connect to other human beings that share a worldview with you, um, even if they're not, you know, your neighbors. Uh, and whereas in times past, you have to transact, you know, life with human, the human beings that are physically around you, which, which means that there's more diversity, uh, just by, by the nature of where you happen to be at any point in time. So I think that that diversity of thought, uh, that comes up when people just bump into each other, uh, isn't helping us be more flexible in our thinking and so for me, the pattern is, is about uh, very quickly forming tribal worldviews uh, and labeling people as either with us or against us. And uh, it bothers me. It, uh, it's, it's troubling to me. Uh, this is why I wanted to have uh, a much longer conversation with you than we have time for today. Um, that's so fascinating and so articulate. And I 
wish I could dumb that down into a soundbite to put online, which is hilariously ironic since that's what we're discussing, but I can't. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is, um, I totally agree with you. I have to say, I, I completely agree that it's not that you're not allowed to have thoughts and test them out and bounce them around, but like the, the, it's the speed at which you're suddenly like not on a team or on a team and you don't even understand how that team developed and all that. Wow. That, that was very profound. That really got me thinking. Um, we are headed up to the end of the interview and I always like my guests to have the floor just to say whatever they want to say. Um, so do you have any thoughts that you want to share with our always growing audience? Well, I'm thrilled that you have an always growing audience. So congratulations. And uh, I think you are a super interesting guy yourself and very smart and obviously well-read. And you you demonstrate both a curiosity, but also a kind of a compassion that uh, I find, you know, um, very kind of likable and attractive. And, and so I think it's not that I have any particular thoughts to share with your audience. It's more what, what we've had together here in the last few minutes is what I wish people would have more often. And uh, what you're demonstrating as an interviewer are the kinds of skills that my company is designed to help other people build and develop. Uh, so I've had a great time being with you and I think it's just, uh, it's easier to see an example of something than to intellectualize around it. So, uh, you know, people, of pe listeners of the podcast, uh, you know, Mike is your role model, <laughs> go forth and, and get curious and compassionate in your interactions with people just the way he is. Wow. I, uh, I'm red in the face and thank you. I, I just, all I can say to that is thank you. That was incredibly nice of you. And I'm going to record that and I'm going to play it for all my children and I'm going to play it every time they argue with me. <laughs> and anytime they... <laughs> and I'm just going to say, no, 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 I'm a yeah. role model. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah? yeah. Check this out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jay, um, I can't thank you enough. This was such a wonderful interview. I had a great time. Thank you. Mike. Yeah. To everyone listening at home. Thank you again for supporting us and supporting the podcast the uh, best way to support the show is just to head over to mikeyop.com that's m-i-k-e-y-o-p-p.com and sign up for the weekly letter uh, other than that we just want to thank you for listening and thank you for being open-minded and thanks again to Jay for actually working for a living to help people stay open-minded and my name is Mike Oppenheim you have been listening to Coffin Talk and we will see you soon